cells, the tiny building blocks of all living life on the earth. They encompass everything that all organic life does, allowing organisms to function in the first place. We get sick because of cells, and we get cured because of cells. The advancements in medical technology have fully been exploited by our knowledge in cells. But how did we get to this point anyway? Rudolf Virchow was born in Pomerania, Prussia. He was a bit of a tryhard who was thoughtful, attentive, and really good with languages, even earning several distinctions for his academic work. Initially at the age of 18, he wanted to become a pastor to preach to a congregation, but was soon afraid of the weakness of his voice. He soon decided to ditch this effort and studied medicine at the Friedrich Wilhelms Institute in Berlin upon graduation in 1839 and receiving a military scholarship. But studying medicine was not that simple, you see, because in the 1800s, medicine was split into anatomy and pathology, with the former being in a brighter spot than the latter. Anatomists were already describing the human body with precision during the 16th century, with Flemish anatomist Andreas Vesalius, who after finding the practices of surgical anatomy in disarray, decided to take matters into his own hands. With the ethical plan of digging out graves of the dead, stealing flesh off of decaying prisoners, and also stealing specimens from the hospital. He then teamed up with a painter and published The Fabric of the Human Body in seven volumes. And with that, anatomy was placed at the center of medicine. The world that Virchow entered was completely bleak, however, with virtually no studies on human diseases and their causes. Most diseases were attributed to miasmas, poisonous gas caused by sewages or contaminated air, carrying particles that entered the body and forcing it to decay. The main problem for scientists during Virchow's era in the 18th to 19th century is that they wanted to search for a way on why diseases affected the organs, only to come back with unsatisfactory results, however determining that each disease was merely the dysfunction of the organs. Perhaps there was an underlying principle that connects all of this. Perhaps it was microscopic, because you see, Chemists already discovered that certain properties of matter were due to atoms or molecules and their composition, things that cannot be seen. Perhaps biology was similar. Most works on pathology and physiology were purely speculative. How organs work, what their functions are, or why they fall into dysfunction. The confusing division among pathologists was already rigid enough for Virchow's liking. He eventually graduated free from the rigidness of the institute. He decided that he would indeed need to dwell back on the history of pathology for him to finally find a systematic method to understand human physiology and pathology. It soon came to his discovery that researchers have found that animals and plants are composed of tiny structures called cells. He thought perhaps these cells were the heart of human physiology and pathology. If cellular pathology had not yet exist, he was determined to build it from the ground up. In the 1670s, a simple Dutch trader by the name of Antoine van Leeuwenhoek figured his way to see the invisible world of cells. He built himself a microscope, using a single lens on a brass plate and erecting a stage to mount specimens. This was built upon Hans and Zacharias Janssen, who figured that placing two magnifying lenses on the ends of a tube could allow them to see microscopic organisms. At first, Leeuwenhoek used his lens just to check the quality of cloth, but he soon found a deep passion on observing whatever he could find with his microscope. After a storm that had occurred on the 26th of May, 1675, Leeuwenhoek gathered some rainwater that had accumulated on his rooftop, waited a day before observing it under the microscope. What he saw he described as animalcules, dozens of tiny organisms he found. He would go on to upgrade his materials and spend more time observing these organisms before eventually, in 1676, sent his findings to the most impressive scientific society of his time, the Royal Society of London. A year later, he would observe human sperm, that from his own as well as from another man who had gonorrhea. A lot of scientists were dismissive of his findings, partly due to his reclusive nature and his tendency to prevent others from observing under his microscope providing vague details of his scientific methods use. His ambiguity in his writings and a lack of background in science caused his reputation to take a hit, 
resulting in most scientists ignoring him. As he grew more annoyed and anxious, he retreated back to his own tiny world of observing these tiny creatures. Writing in 1716, My work, which I have done for a long time, was not pursued in order to gain the praise I now enjoy, but chiefly for my craving after knowledge, which I notice resides in me more than most other men. Meanwhile, a decade before Leeuwenhoek wrote to the Royal Society of London, a scientist by the name of Robert Hooke had also seen cells, though not as diverse as those of Leeuwenhoek, nor were they living cells. Using his own microscope, more advanced than that of Leeuwenhoek, he would eventually publish his findings in 1665, which was met with critical acclaim. Leeuwenhoek would hear of Hooke's work and would write to him frequently, only to be met with periodic responses but he ensured Leeuwenhoek that his letters were translated and presented to the Royal Society. It was to note that Hooke had limited contributions to cell biology thinking, mainly because he did not suggest that the structures he found were the basic units of life. He was too eager to spring onto the next topic, eventually losing interest in microscopy and returned to mechanics and physics instead. Eventually, Hooke found himself in a dispute with Isaac Newton, stating that the discoveries Newton made were his and was plagiarized. This argument famously went on for decades. Eventually, Newton had the final say, with the only portrait of Hope going missing as the Royal Society moved to the new quarters in 1710 under the orders of Newton, seven years after Hope's death. The history of studying biology has often been filled with great voids of silence after a great discovery is made. Yet these periods were perhaps not silent, rather scientists were trying to figure out if it was a fact or purely fiction. These periods required innovation of new apparatuses to explore the answers to these questions. It was not until the 1950s that DNA could be observed, with the birth of X-ray crystallography that could decipher the 3D structures of molecules. But for cells, you would have to quite literally see through the flesh to imagine blood. Perhaps these valleys of silences were the changes required to see an entity, the cell under a microscope a gene as a unit of heritage, to understand more universally the functions and behaviours of these elusive things that exist in biology. From Leeuwenhoek's continuous observations of living atoms under his microscope, other microscopists thought that these living atoms did not just have to be single-celled, rather in more complex organisms, these cells are arranged into tissues. It was Pichat in particular that transitioned cell biology towards histology, the studying of cooperating cells, and the function of tissues. Yet out of all these observations, it was Francois Vincent Raspel that really attempted to build a theory of cell physiology. Cells existed, but they must be doing something to justify their existence. He proposed that cells were composed of different molecules, indicating a semi-permeable membrane that allowed certain substances through. He deduced that cells perform chemical reactions to stabilize the function of tissues, and ultimately, organ systems. More notably, he proposed that cells came from other cells, without providing much explanation for this, nor did he attempt to prove it because of the lack of tools available. In another place, there were two groups debating on cell biology. The vitalists, composed of chemists, biologists, theologians, and philosophers, were convinced that cells could not be made of the natural chemicals in the world. Rather, there must be some divine intervention that separated the fluids from the bodies of living beings. Speculating cells are born within cells, similar to a mother and a fetus, and that cells crystallize from vital fluids, similar to chemicals crystallizing in an inorganic world. Opposing this idea was a small group of scientists, believing that living beings come from living beings and they do not spawn spontaneously. An incredible proposal would come about in the late 1830s, that from Matthias Schlieden and Theodor Schwann, forming the two principles of cell theory. Drawing from their predecessors, not limited to Leeuwenhoek, Hooke, and Raspel, it was proposed that all living organisms were made of one or more cells, and the cell is the most basic structure of life. Yet both of them still struggled to understand. If cells were indeed the building blocks of all life, then where did they come from? As Schlieden questioned the origin of cells, the only mechanism that he could find would be the reason why cells would be so uniformly found in tissues, relating them to a chemical process that could yield more units, such as crystallization. But as Schwann continued looking at tissues, the more he found that this couldn't be true. Where were the living crystals that were mentioned? Despite this concern, 
he was unable to forfeit his vitalistic beliefs, nor could he further understand how a cell was born. Now let's follow up with our old friend, Rudolf Virchow. It was 1845 and he was barely out of medical school, but he examined a woman with abnormal fatigue, an inflamed spleen, and an enlarged abdomen. Upon testing her blood, he found an unusual amount of white blood cells present, gave it the term leukemia. A similar incident was reported in Scotland, but was eventually dismissed as an anomaly. But Virchow was struck. He could not believe that these white blood cells would come out of nowhere, wondering that these cells must have come from other cells, because they look the same, similar to how cancer cells are similar to normal cells. He reasoned that there was no need to invoke divine purposes or special chemicals to describe the formation of new cells. It was that simple. Even so, all cellular physiology laid the basis for physiology. If cells became dysfunctional, then the whole system collapses. Isolated from the bustling city, in 1858, he refined Schwann's and Schlieden's work, adding that all cells came from other cells. Cellular physiology allowed for the function of normal physiology. And disease is the result of disrupted physiology of the cell, publishing them in his most influential book, Cellular Pathology, bringing forward a new age of understanding towards the cell. Microbes, single-celled living organisms that are mostly harmless, but in some cases can invade tissues, causing inflammation, putrefaction, and disease. Back in 1668, Francesco Reddy proposed that maggots, a form of putrefying organism, could only arise from eggs laid onto flesh by flies, and not spontaneously as vitalists suggested. In 1859, Louis Pasteur took this experiment to the next level by using boiled meat broth and a swan neck bottle, proving that bacteria is transmitted through air and putrefaction was not caused by internal decomposition. After studying the infection of anthrax in animals, wine decomposition, and the infection of silkworms, he concluded that it was microbes, tiny organisms foreign to the body, that invade a host and spread disease. In 1876, Robert Koch managed to take Pasteur's experiment even further, isolating anthrax bacteria in samples and observed that these fragile rod-like organisms are potentially dangerous. Being able to form round dormant spores, the bacteria can reactivate after being exposed to the correct conditions. Through a series of experiments involving transferring diseases systematically from one individual to another, he concluded that microbes could be passed on from an infected individual, isolated, and continuously growing in the infected, being able to recreate the same sickness in a healthy host, and continue to spread the disease. In 1864 Scotland, Joseph Lister came across Pasteur's paper on the growth of microbes when exposed to the open air. In Lister's time, surgery was extremely unhygienic, with surgical probes being used on multiple patients without sterilization. Lister decided to sterilize his tools with carbolic acid, as he knew it removed the stench from sewage water. The rate of post-surgical infections dropped exponentially, and as other physicians saw the evidence, they followed suit. The growth of infection prevention, sterility, hygiene, and antisepsis would be further changed with the introduction of antibiotics. Every antibiotic works by recognizing a core molecular component of human cells that are different from bacterial cells. It's a medicine for the cell, distinguishing between the microbial cell from the host cell. Penicillin works because it kills bacterial enzymes that synthesize the cell wall, which are not present in human cells. But bacteria are surprisingly ferocious. You may find them living in extreme conditions, dominating the natural world. More importantly, bacteria are different from most organisms. They are simple life forms known as prokaryotes, classified with the lack of a nucleus. Fungi, animals, and plants, on the other hand, are considered eukaryotes because of the presence of the nucleus in those cells. Compared to bacteria, eukaryotes are feeble and weak, only being able to live in niche environments, less extreme to the oceanic thermal vents that some bacteria live in. But there is another separate branch, proposed in the 1970s by Carl Woos, comparing genes among various microorganisms and deducing that we have in fact misclassified an entire new domain of life, archaea. Little is known about them because we've ignored studying this group as a whole. Perhaps the archaea can fill in the missing gaps of how the first cell arose. The first cell, or more notably proposed as a protocell, would require storage for its genetic information that it could pass on. 
it was almost certain that this system was the RNA, a single-stranded molecule. But the distance between an RNA strand to a self-replicating RNA molecule is a huge evolutionary leap. It most likely requires two molecules, one acting as a template, or the other makes a copy of the template. To avoid both RNA strands from floating away, a structure, or perhaps a membrane, was required to confine these components, to enable the creation of cellular life. The confinement of both RNA strands would enable more RNA to be made, enlarging the sphere. Eventually, it would have to split off and carry the same RNA duplication mechanism. The protocell would begin its evolution to the cells that we know of today, with even more complex characteristics arising, replacing RNA with DNA instead. Bacteria evolved from its predecessor 3 billion years ago, and it's still going on till to this day. Archaea are most likely around the same age as bacteria, although there are still some debates about this. But what about eukaryotes? About 2 billion years ago, something unexpected occurred in evolution. The common ancestor for animal, plant, fungal, and amoeba cells appeared on Earth. Evidence suggests that this modern eukaryotic cell arose from archaea. Or to put it simply, there are two domains of life, bacteria and archaea. But eukaryotes are a sub-branch of archaea, the leftovers from the two main domains in life.